So, here's what I believe. I believe our species is about to take an evolutionary leap in culture. And this time, I think it's about the way we're going to make things. You know those manufacturing plants on the edge of town with the razor wire around them and the lights on all night long? Parts of that manufacturing are coming into the city. They're coming to your neighborhood. They're going to come into your house. And people are calling this our generation's industrial revolution. It's our Gutenberg press, our assembly line, right? Our transistor. And I agree. I think that the ability for anyone to make anything anywhere on demand to make an object is going to have a big impact. But I have a question as a biologist. Is this going to be more benign than the last industrial revolution? Is it going to be beneficial to all life? Is it going to be biologically compatible? This industrial revolution is coming towards us, and this time we can see it. And we have a choice. We can make, we can use the metaphors of the rusty machine age, or we can consult biological wisdom. And if we choose the latter, we are in luck, because we are surrounded by biological wisdom. We are not the first to manufacture. Put yourself here. When I walk through a place like this, I think manufacturing zone. There are tens of thousands of tons of material and chemicals being made every instant, without a plume of pollution. It's silent. It's fragrant. There are no need for razor wires, or hard hats, or ear guards, or skulls and crossbones in this zone. And when I crunch through these leaves, I don't see refuse. I see the raw materials of the next life form. I see supply chain. The Japanese have a name for walking through places like this. They call it forest bathing. Can we bathe in our manufacturing zones? I think we can, but we have to get some first principles down. What is it about those places? What is it about this world that makes it work? First of all, what's abundant is golden. For us, what's rare, the rare earths, the gold. It's gold. That's what's precious, metals. What's abundant is golden. True abundance is needing what it is that's right around you. This tree is built to shape. There's no waste left over. It's not cut down, you know, with waste from some bolt of wood. It's one material. Safe chemistry, and reincarnated. Logs don't decompose into the soil the way they, we think they do. They upcycle into the bodies. They reincarnate, so that the log becomes fungus, and the materials in the fungus become vole, and the materials in the vole become this spectacular great gray owl. It's local. It's safe. It's cyclic. It's existence proof that it can be done, but this is our revolution. So first of all, we have to really look at the two stories of stuff, because we chose a different path for sure. 3.8 billion years ago, that cyanobacteria came up and began the first making revolution. Right? We've only been at this industrial revolution for about 250 years, so it's much older. Life chose life-friendly chemistry. That caribou does not put his head in a kiln to make that ceramic, and yet in a few weeks, a tough, tough ceramic is created. We use a lot of high heats, a lot of pressure, a lot of chemicals. That's why we need razor wire. Life is additive. This term, additive manufacturing, life builds to shape. We tend to cut things down. So, in a manufacturing parts catalog, the biggest part is for cutting and grinding tools because we carve things down. 96% waste, 4% product. We use all the elements in the periodic table because we can. Life uses a safe subset. In fact, most materials on this planet are made with six elements. 
And when those elements are put into materials, into polymers, what, what are like our plastics, long chains, those polymer systems, there's only about five of them. Keratin, collagen, chitin, not very many. We use, every time we need a new function, we make a new plastic. We have about 350 and counting. That makes it hard to recycle. So they wind up dispersed all over the place, like plastic swirling in the ocean gyres. Life concentrates materials, doesn't disperse them. These are deep patterns. What happens is that that one material system, that chitin composite that that beetle is made of, has all the functionality it needs. What it does is it adds information to matter, it adds structure to matter. So that when the beetle wants it to be abrasion resistant, it lays up the chitin fibrils in a plywood hatch. When it wants breathability, it makes a pore. When it wants color, it puts down transparent layers that play with light to create color. We, we do like seven layers in our chip bags, in our candy bags. You know, oxygen exclusion, one layer. Inking, another layer. And then it's hard to recycle. But this story of stuff that we have, we made it up. You know, nature keeps what works. Ancient organism, the shark. But it changes what doesn't. Let's have another eye, says the jumping spider, right? It changes by adapting and evolving. So here's the question. Can we evolve this story of stuff? It's starting. Look at this. We're not cutting it down anymore. We're building to shape, layer by layer. That's as close to biomimetic as I've seen. It's an enabling technology. The DNA is in the computer-aided design, the digital blueprints. We can put complexity inside. This is a Venus uh, flower basket. It's a, it's a glass. It's made of silica, a glass sponge. Incredible intricacy. But now we can do that kind of intricacy too. We can build to shape. There aren't the holes that we poke out of those guitars. We can build a whole car to shape. One material in these shoes. The structure changes to grant function. Does that sound familiar? When you go to your famous footwear, you're not going to have thousands of boxes of shoes. You're going to have five printers and a new generation of artisans. This is nervous system stuff, it's beautiful. The algorithms come from leaf venation. Designs are going to cross, crisscross the globe. In, life runs on information, and we, we do too. It's getting cheaper and cheaper, very high resolution printer, the Form 1, and even some toy things for 100 bucks. So here's my house. I want a 3D printer really badly. Manufacturing is coming home, but I'm wondering, who's going to take out my hazardous waste trash? <laughs> this is our revolution. We don't have to do this, you guys. <laughs> so, with biomimicry, the work that I'm in, we look to the natural world and we say, how can nature intervene in this system? And you can intervene in every single one of these things. If you're an entrepreneur, if you want to start a new business, if you're a teacher, let's do this. Supply chain, build files. Those are the 3D computer-aided design files that go in the printer. The chemistry in the printer, and then the return logistics. So look at what biomimicry is doing so far in this. A simplified supply chain. Remember those five polymer systems? God, you know what we have a lot of right now? Carbon dioxide. These plants that these ants are carrying, they are 50% by weight, carbon dioxide. We have a lot of that right now. So, local raw material, carbon dioxide. This is Novomer. They're making plastics that are 50% by weight, carbon dioxide. Unilever just invested in them. They learned it from plants. Ceramics from waste CO2. This is a sea urchin that's teaching us how to pull the CO2 out of smokestacks to make ceramics, because you use those in 3D printing as well. Our waste cellulose, our papers, when you recycle them, the fibers get shorter and shorter, and we finally landfill them. There's a group in Sweden that's learning how to take those tiny fibers and put them back together the way a tree builds cellulose. Elegant structure. There are no dyes in this picture. It's all structural color. 
And now that we can lay down layer by layer, let's make the color come from the layers that we dial in. This is a group in Harvard.、Uh, they're making, they're taking actually the chitin, which is in seafood waste, and they use the architecture from the dragonfly's wing, and they layer it up in that plywood hatch I talked about, and it's the strength of aluminum with half the weight, and it's biodegradable. <laughs> LEDs. Fireflies have LED lanterns in a way, right? And in order to make them really, really bright, they put those tiles inside the lantern. When we put them on LEDs, that same pattern, we get 55% more light from the LEDs. <sighs> Life-friendly chemistry. Life uses water as a solvent. We use toxic solvents. Imagine pouring water into your printer instead. There's a whole bunch of people working on water-based chemistry. A whole bunch of right now. I, I, I checked this morning. Self-assembly, which is putting molecules together and allowing them to jigsaw naturally without any heat, it's called self-assembly. There are 308 books on Amazon with self-assembly in the title. This is quite a mature research project. This is really cool. A group in Sweden, again, Ulot. They are doing. Uh, surface-based chemistry. It's inspired by the ribosome, the thing that makes the proteins in your body, and it puts amino acid after amino acid using DNA as the template. They're doing thin film surface chemistry to basically grow molecules in your printer, not yet. And then the product should come back, right? As it does in the natural world. Life is really good at this. So there's a bunch of people, biologists, who study molting and who study sh- the shedding of skin. It's timed degradation. Here's John Warner, and he's making polymers again, plastics, where the raw materials, the building blocks, have little molecular hooks on them. You shine UV light, they come together for as long as the product's needed. And then when it's not needed, you put it in an enzyme bath, shine UV light again, they come apart. Life's chemistries are unzippable. This is based on what happens in your body when you get a sunburn, and then an enzyme comes in and repairs it. How do we make sure? John, John's a、uh, medicinal chemist, but not everybody knows these patterns. So how do we make sure that nature's wisdom is available to all makers at the moment of creation? Don't you love this guy? We need a biological intelligence service, BIS. We're starting. This is called askanature.org. Check it out. You can put a function, a design and engineering function, in there, and up will come nature's strategies. But it needs to be much more robust for this maker's culture.、And、I want you to join this. It is. It's a wiki. It's a. It's a public domain, self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> What we want to do is have people be able to quickly understand the biological strategy, get the design principle, an application idea, and then download. A 3D model that goes right into the tools they use every day. Those computer-aided design, computer-aided design tools. But first, we have to scan the biological world. There's only 140 natural history museums. Let's have scan jams. Go in there with our cell phones, pull out the drawers, and scan some of these natural models, and then put them in 3D, so they're available, downloadable. An architect's not going to read a paper on how nature handles compressive strength. We have to put that intelligence in a truss if they're building a building that they can download. We need to put the the LED lights, the pattern from that firefly, in our computer-aided design. Right? We need optimization tools. This is one that's based on bones and how they how your bone、uh, responds to stress and light weights everything else except exactly where it's needed. And now that algorithm is used to lightweight parts. We need those right in the right in the printer files. We need a chemistry recommendation engine so that when you go to make a toxic reaction in your printer chemistry, you've got some alternative, like this natural silica formation. And lastly, we need these deep life's principles to be an interactive guide to keep life's wisdom right in front of us. We need to become lifelong learners. Can we do this? People always say, "Oh, it's not in our nature." You know what kind of species we are? We're kind of a species that does this. We're a phenomenal species, and we are nature. Don't forget that. 
take heart. We're very young. We're only 200,000 years old, not 3.8 billion. We do have a very big impact, but guess what? We can choose what that impact will be. We can tell our children gentle. And we don't have to do this alone. There are 30 million species, 18,000 new ones a year. Yes, many on the ropes. We have no time to lose. But we are surrounded by genius, not just in this room, but out those doors. I live in Western Montana, and I am surrounded by genius. I'm surrounded by 21 wolf packs. And I've never seen one. I'm out there all the time, but I know they're there. And one day there was a wolf, because what I saw, I was skiing with a friend of mine. I had my long skinny skis on. We were in the backcountry, and I left a perfectly good trail. Do not do this. <laughs> this is not recommended. And the reason I did it was I wanted to sniff a ponderosa pine, because ponderosa pine, when they've been cooking all day in the sun, they smell like vanilla. And they're irresistible. So I skied through all these willows and all this underbrush. I smelled my pine, and then I realized I was completely stuck. And then I heard a crashing, like I have never heard, coming towards me. And I turned around, and this was coming towards me: a thousand pounds at 35 miles an hour. But unfortunately, he wasn't looking at me. He was looking behind him at the wolf that was probably chasing him, and he was coming straight at me, and I was stuck in my skis. And you know when you have that dream where you're being chased and you can't get anything out? I just went, <laughs> and he heard me, because his ears pivot 360 degrees, and he heard me, and he swung around, and he looked at me just before he hit me, and he leapt up in the air. <laughs> And he turned, and he disappeared. And I looked, and I looked, and I realized there was a perfectly formed little game trail right next to me. And so I took it, and it got me home. We have to remember we are not the first to manufacture, but this is our revolution, right? We can choose this. It doesn't have to be as industrial as the last. It doesn't even have to be a bloody revolution. It need, can be an evolution. We can go forest bathing, but we have to say this is our revolution, and we're going to do it differently. And luckily, there's plenty of help out there. If we get this right, we get to do what I think we really, really want to do, which is to stay here. On this home that is ours, but not ours alone. It's time to make our way home. Thank you so much.